so don't you worry. I got it on my end. I'll record this and post it up later, assuming nothing negative happens. But uh, OBS has been giving me some some challenges as of late. But um, anyway, so I wanted to answer a few questions here. Um, you guys had. I'm loving all these video game references. Um, someone said, can you please show an example of how to calculate a weight-based doses, uh, or calculate weight-based doses for IV drugs? Not sure if I'm making it more complicated than it has to be, but I'm feeling really lost right now. I'm really sorry you're feeling that way, but we can correct that. Um, so let's say for instance, and again, you probably are making it more complicated because you've been doing this for a while now, right? Um, all those pediatric dose assignments, that's basically what we've been doing. Um, you might just be a little bit intimidated by switching gears to more of the inpatient encounter side of things. So um, just to give you an example, let's say we had a patient um, who was actively seizing. Let's say we have a 13 kilogram child. Um, they're seizing, so we wanna give, uh, let's do some Ativan, right? So we'll do lorazepam. And we wanna do um, 0 0.1 milligrams per kilogram. Okay, and we'll do that IV once. And so we wanna calculate that out. So then you say, okay, well, um, you know, how much is that going to be? And it's pretty straightforward. You really just take the 13 kilograms, you multiply it by the 0 0.1 milligrams per kilogram, and then equal that out and they get 1.3 milligrams because uh, the kilograms would cancel that out at that point. So your order would look something like lorazepam, 1.3 milligrams IV push once, right? And that would just be your order. That's all you have to do at that point, okay? Um, a lot of times your systems, like your EMRs, you'll have buttons you can just click. So you could just hit the 0.1 mix per kilo and it'll calculate it for you. But I think it's still good for you to be able to know how to do it yourself should you be put into that position. So uh, hopefully that makes a sense. Um, you know, if you wanted to do something like, say, for instance, um, let's say you wanted to do a drip of something. So let's say we wanted to do... Um, I don't know, let's just do uh, morphine, like a morphine drip for pain. Uh, we wanted to do 0 0.05 mg per kilo, do the math a little bit more difficult, uh, milligrams per kilo per hour, okay? And let's say we have the same size kid there. Well, you have know, to take the calculator out here. We do, I'll move it over so you guys can see it. Um, <clears throat> here we do 0 0.05 mg per kilo per hour times 13 kilos. Your kilos still cancel out, right? And so at that point there, you could say, uh, morphine drip, uh, 0 0.65 milligrams per hour. So that way, just the kilograms is what gets canceled out, and then you just have that dose per hour that you'd have. Then on our end, on the pharmacy end, we would figure out the concentration to use. We'd figure out how big of a syringe to send. And then uh, what the fluid rate would actually be based off of that concentration. We would send it over, nurses could hook it up to the pump, and then everything is good to go. Okay. Um, so yeah, don't overcomplicate it. And honestly, if you can just follow your units and make sure you cancel things out where appropriate based off of what you're multiplying, it's fairly straightforward. So um, Matt was asking about uh, IV antibiotics and given, get, to give over 30 minutes due to, uh, you know, what's the reason for that? Some of it could be related to monitoring for reactions, but some drugs you'll find can cause reactions if given too quickly. So it could be irritating to the veins. Um, if you're giving like a really big bolus push of, of meds, um, you know, if it's not desperately emergent, it's not a problem to give us things over 30 minutes. Um, you know, for instance, I know, I'm just trying to think, I think a lot of our aminoglycosides we can do over 30 minutes to an hour. Um, some things have to go over longer because we do know they can cause reactions. So I, I think Vanco is probably the, the best example of that, you know, give over usually 90 minutes to two hours in most instances in order to avoid the, the red man syndrome, just like you said, Isabel. Um, so those are the points um, I would make there. If something can be given via IV push, there's no problem to do that. And you know, it's funny cause like IV push is technically supposed to be like between one to five minutes or something like that. A lot of places will define it like that. But if you match like a nurse, like you imagine if you're standing at bedside and you're trying to push something, um, what's gonna feel like a minute to you is probably like 10 seconds. So very frequently things just get given much faster than what you may anticipate, but. At least that's why we use pumps, right? Uh, at least for, for kids and stuff, we'll, we'll go ahead and hook them up onto a pump, and that way we can set how long it, it runs over instead of having to rely for the, the human um, component of it. So hopefully that makes a sense to you, and maybe you feel a little less lost. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, someone said, regarding the Rx assignment on up-to-date, there's a warning about combining opioids and benzos. How would we get around that? Well, what's the warning is the question, right? So... 
Uh, remember, a warning is just something to watch out for. It's not like it says, do not give together because we do so quite frequently. So if you had to think about it, you know, what would be some of the problems that you'd run into with opioids plus benzos? I don't know if anyone would want to answer that. <clears throat> CNS depression, that could be one thing, right? What's sort of the the thing that could kill somebody? Respiratory depression, very good, Matt. So that would be the big thing to, to note with that is respiratory and CNS depression, right? Because they can be very synergistic together. Um, however, what is the situation with our patient? They're sedated, right? But what's the other big thing about from the respiratory standpoint? They're intubated, very good. So they're intubated, we don't have to really worry about that because we are breathing for them. So even if they get over sedated, um, it's not gonna be necessarily a problem because the, the vent can, can do it. Not, not that you wanna over sedate them, but uh, that's why nurses will have protocols in terms of like titrating to certain scales, um, in terms of like certain sedation scales. So if you ever hear of like a RAS scale, RAS scale, that could be one. Um, there's several of them that are out there. Uh, Shelby's saying everyone in the ICU is on Versed and fentanyl. That's super common. Uh, some people will just be like on propofol by itself. We'll talk more about those in the surgery section later on. Um, but uh, yeah, there's lots of options that are available to you. Some have uh, some pros and cons, and, and we can get into that a little bit later. But yeah, fentanyl and Versed, that's like, Probably 90% of people intubated will be sedated using that combo in particular. Just what we do. <clears throat> uh, some said for something like continuous normal saline, it is appropriate to write out as 0.9% NACL, blank mLs continuous IV, or do we need to write how many mLs per minute? So keep it per hour, right? So um, in general, most continuous infusions will be so many of our mLs per hour or milligrams per hour, whatever the case may be. So like that morphine drip I mentioned was milligrams per hour fluids just because there's not like a specific dose associated with them it's just in mls so for instance if you wanted to write for d5 ns so dextrose five percent plus normal saline which is 0.9 percent nacl um 125 mls per hour if you just wrote 125 mls that's that that would be like a bolus that's just how much they would get in total but per hour means that that's how much they're going to get uh, every single hour until you modify that order or discontinue it there are some things that will be per minute this is usually more so with like cardiovascular meds you'll see used in the icu so on our assignment let's say we had our patient require a norepi drip for blood pressure management we haven't covered pressors yet but we'll get there and um you might do that as like say 0.1 mics per kilo per minute right? It's important to keep those distinctions in mind because if you screw that up and do it per hour versus per minute, you could either get 60 times more of a dose than you intended or you get 1 60th of the dose, which is neither is, is going to be good for the patient there. Um, yeah, so that's, that's how I would handle that. What other, any other questions before we get started with the rest of the material? I feel like we, uh, you might have answered this last class, but how would an order look with the loading dose? Yeah, so Alyssa, that's about the loading dose. So what we could do for that, um, so let's say like, I'm trying to think of a good example. Let's say, so let's do like phenytoin, right? So let's go ahead and do phenytoin. Um, actually, that's probably not a good example because that doesn't get followed up by continuous infusion. Let's do like lidocaine, continuous infusion, right? Um, so lidocaine, you would do, um, you could write as a one milligram per kilogram uh, IV once, you know, and then based on the weight of your patient, you put how many milligrams to give. And then you could do something like a lidocaine infusion, how many of our mics per kilo per hour, whatever the case may be. Um, but you know, you have the units per hour IV and, and that would be it basically. Um, so just make sure that the bolus is just as a one-time order and then you follow it up by the continuous infusion. So pretty straightforward. And again, like once you see like five of them in, in real life, like it'll make total sense. Like um, it, it just seems a little, I don't know, maybe awkward now because you just, you're so new to it. I wouldn't worry too, too much. Oh, would you have to say how many hours later to follow up with continuous infusion? So for that, um, a lot of times... If you're doing a bolus dose, you can just follow up with a continuous infusion. Most of the time, the loading dose is meant to get this, someone to steady state, and then you can follow up with that. Say, for instance, you wanted to do something like a phenytoin loading dose, and then you wanted to follow up with intermittent maintenance dosing. At that point, what you could do is say something like, you know, phenytoin 20 in, uh, milligrams per kilogram IV once, and then you would set the time. You would say, okay, um, next I wanted to do, I don't know, phenytoin 
eight milligrams per kilogram IV Q8 hours. And at that point, you would just say, start at this time. And you would schedule it, you know, say six hours, eight hours after the first dose, whatever the case may be. So you can get really specific in terms of saying, like, don't start this until this time. Um, don't start this until patient is um, tolerating PO fluids. You could you could set a lot of parameters on that sort of thing that hopefully the nurses will read and, and, and you know, be able to follow that, right? And hopefully your pharmacy team is going to be able to interpret your orders and be able to do it, you know, set it up appropriately, and then the nursing people can carry it out. Or respiratory therapist or whoever is, is going to be carrying out the orders that you're writing there because you're the boss. You're, you're the ones calling the shots, right? Um, yeah, I said no loading doses on the assignment. Um, it's funny, I had two, two tandem questions. Uh, yeah, I just want to keep it simple. Don't worry about loading doses on the assignment. Just go ahead and just, I just want you to get experience writing the orders themselves. A lot of times what you'll find, at least um, depending on, on the, the flow of things, a lot of times patients in the ER will get intubated and part of that intubation is, sed is sedating the patient because you don't want to intubate someone who's conscious. Uh, that would be quite mean. Um, so usually they're still sedated from the intubation that you just follow up with a continuous infusion. You don't have to necessarily bolus them unless they started to like move around or wake up. Then you could do a bolus as needed uh, for that purpose there. So hopefully that works out for you guys. Uh, let's see. No other questions. Fantastic. So let's go ahead and continue up. Um, did I talk about the, I think I talked about the, the depot shot um, <clears throat> with you guys already. So don't worry about that. So we talked about like the delayed return to ovulation. We talked about the amenorrhea that's pretty common with this one. Um, and again, if some, you had someone like really wanted to schedule out when they got pregnant. So imagine um, someone was in uh, PA school and they said, okay, well, I definitely don't want to get pregnant during school, but I may want to afterwards, right? You could schedule that out, but this would be something that would be more challenging because of the fact um, that you could have that delayed return there. Using something like a typical oral contraceptive would be a little bit simpler in terms of that, so... Um, a couple other miscellaneous products here. So these are going to be a lot of our IUDs. There's a few other ones, but I don't hit the common ones you're going to see. Um, and I don't, I sent this, I sent an article to, um, to Professor Lack, but there's a, an interesting Wikipedia page you can check out. There's something called the Daikon Shield, the D-A-I-K-O-N Shield. And it was this like uh, IUD that was developed back in the seventies. I guess like killed like just a, just a huge number of women who use this thing. And if you look at the picture of it, it looks like this crazy trilobite looking thing with like hooks on it. I don't know. It looks awful. I would not want to use that. But today's IUDs are, are much safer. Uh, but I suggest you, you take a look at that if you want to see something kind of wild from the past. But <clears throat> basically, we have IUDs that can be placed directly into the uterus. And the nice thing with this is that it's able to work very locally, right? So levonorgestrel is a common one you're going to find. Here's an example of Marina. Um, notice that it can be placed in the uterus. So this would have to be done by the provider to place it. Notice the strings uh, hanging out. That way it can be removed later if need be. Um, and it just supplies local progesterone activity. And it's really designed just to make the environment very unhospitable towards implantation and fertilization to occur. Um, and so the benefits of this, what it would, uh, you know, limit how much systemic exposure the patient has to overall, any, any hormones in general. But in this case here, it's just a progesterone. So they don't really get any of the estrogen effects um, you'd expect to see from, say, something taken orally. So that's kind of a benefit uh, from that standpoint there, which is nice. And again, um, from a compliance standpoint, this is really good because it basically, you know, it lasts for five years. So as you get it placed once and you kind of don't have to worry about it for quite some time uh, unless, you know, say the patient wanted to become pregnant or something like that. It could, it could be removed uh, relatively easily. Um, there are some risks with it since it can, um, there's been some cases of some of these IEDs actually displacing out into the abdomen, which is certainly an, an emergent sort of thing there if you were to find that. So that's why people usually be brought back usually in a couple of days or a week or so after having these placed, just to make sure that it's staying right where it's supposed to in the uterus. Now, Isabel's saying, since it's just progesterone, is it less effective than birth control with estrogen progesterone? I don't know of any data that shows that it's less effective, um, but if you think about it, you're getting higher concentrations of progesterone in the area where you need it most, if that's what you are using it for, uh, for birth control, right? So, and again, it's, it's not going to be useful for acne, it's not going to be useful for any of the other things you may use oral contraceptives for. But in this case here, for birth control purposes, it's working very locally, you get relatively high concentrations that stay there. Um, so I don't know of any decreased efficacy from that standpoint. So that's um, kind of the, the nice trade off with that, right? Local action really helps out. Um, 
Here's an example of uh, the Nuva Ring, which is a combination of ethanol estradiol and edonogesterol. So you get the progestin estrogen co uh, combination there. Um, how we get to the abdomen, perforation into the uterus. Yes, that would be exactly what happens there. Uh, it's not common, but it's, uh, you know, something that is serious enough that you definitely want to check out if that were to occur. Uh, but oral birth control is less effective if it is just progesterone. Correct. That is correct, Isabel. So just progestin-only based contraception that is not, you know, basically an IUD uh, is going to be less effective, especially just like a mini pill or something they were taking um, orally. The progestin-only is going to be less effective overall, for sure. Um, but anyway, here's a case here where this could be used. Um, this is on more of a cyclical basis where they do with three weeks in, placed intravaginally one week out. This, again, is something the patient can do themselves. Um, but again, think about things like, you know, this product has to be kept in the fridge when it's not um, in use. Uh, you know, so things like storage instructions can be important. And you'll get a feel for that once you kind of work with some of the products there. Um, you know, again, if this comes out, patient can just put it right back in. No problem from that standpoint. This is for patients that have really good insurance, called the Nuva Bling. Um, you know, just for your bougie, your patients who may want something a little bit fancier. I'm just kidding. That looks like it would be very uncomfortable, so I would not recommend using that product there. Um, there are other ways to do this too. So for instance, you could have uh, Implanon, which is an edonogesterol, um, actual implantable product here. And again, this would be something that would be put in by the provider. Um, again, it could supply long-acting uh, progesterone activity for three years in this case here, as opposed to getting a depo shot every three months, they could just do this once every three years. Uh, but again, being a more systemically acting progesterone, you do run into some of the problems like delayed return of ovulation. Although once this product is out, like the thing that's leaching the medicine is gone. So hopefully that would be a little bit faster than if it was um, simply like a depo shot, like, you know, the Depo Provera. Um, although you will saw some irregular bleeding associated with this. So that's one of the more common things you'll see with a product like that. And again, the point is just to show you different options that are available here, right? Um, this one's really kind of interesting. You know, if you think about um, heavy metals in terms of their use for um, different things, like if you actually think about like, you know, um, you ever heard the term like born with a silver spoon in their mouth? You know, like you always think about that as being like a um, a reference to someone being born rich, which is probably how it's used nowadays. But it actually has to do with being healthy uh, originally because silver, it has antimicrobial properties. And so it was thought that if you had a silver spoon in your mouth, that would be able to keep you healthy. And so that was sort of the saying back then. I'm not going to ask you the, the duration of action, no. Um, again, you'll get comfortable with these products if you work with them and you'll, you'll kind of get a feel. Just know that's one of the benefits is you can get long acting effects out of these products here. Uh, but anyway, so it's interesting to find different places for metals to be used. We talked about gold products being used in, in uh, rheumatologic conditions. Here's a case where we can actually use copper. So using copper um, in this paragard here can be utilized uh, basically, again, having this environment where you're leaching out these copper ions uh, makes it very difficult for implantation to occur. Sperm really don't like it. They don't really, uh, transport as easily as they normally would. And so it does provide good benefits there. And again, changed every 10 years. So it's one of those things that's kind of set it and forget it from that standpoint, which is kind of beneficial, I think. <clears throat> And again, you can see some cases like emergency contraception being used with a Paragard. Um, you know, uh, I didn't get too much into that last time because I mainly wanted to focus on the hormonal-based uh, ones. But this is one example of a non-hormonal-based product that could be used for uh, emergency contraception. Basically, you just place this after uh, probably within that 72 hours, I would imagine. Maybe it changes, but um, and that could you know prevent the, the pregnancy from occurring there. Okay, so that's it mainly for the birth control products there. Um, again, remember kind of what are like your big contraindications to use for these products, kind of know the differences between why would you use, um, you know, an estrogen progestin combination versus progesterone or what are the, the trade-offs you see with that, um, you know, side, common side effects, you know, uh, kind of understand about the, um, you know, the differences between like, you know, a biphasic versus a monophasic, just what the difference means in terms of like changing the dose, um, uh, through, you know, throughout the cycle there. Um, how to schedule things if you needed to, if you need to move someone's period around, you could do that, you know, the honeymooning technique we mentioned, all those kind of things I think are, you know, you guys probably have a pretty good feel for it already. So anyway, there are different ways we can try to inhibit or antagonize the effects of estrogen in the body. So um, I'll give you a few examples here uh, that we'll go through in, in some more detail, but you can kind of do it from every level of this whole axis here. So going all the way from the hypothalamus down, we can do things like 
by giving either GNRH antagonist or agonist. We'll see that we can have some variable effect there. Um, we'll see things um, such as like clomiphene or contraceptives can have effects on FSH and LH, which you know to suppress ovarian function. Um, and then you will also find things like aromatase inhibitors can have a really strong effect here as well. This is important for patients who you want to really drop down their estrogen levels. This is like the way to do it because it's basically going to keep all this estradiol from being formed. It's going to be stuck as testosterone. Now, you might imagine there's going to be some side effects associated with that. Uh, and that's certainly something that will be borne out in the upcoming slides here. But we'll look at some different options here and how they might be used potentially for our patients. So <clears throat> getting into it first with our selective estrogen receptor modulators or CIRMs. Uh, the first one we actually had was tamoxifen or Nolvidex. And basically these products here are going to be acting as an agonist in some tissues as an estrogen, but an antagonist in others. Okay. And so the benefit of that is you get some selective action in terms of what you're looking for with these particular agents here. So as an example, um, uh, tamoxifen can act as an agonist in the bone and in the endometrium, but an antagonist in the breast tissue, right? Because I wouldn't want to block estrogen effects throughout the entire body for someone with breast cancer, because then I worry about osteoporosis, right? However, you might see here, okay, well, you know, it still has positive effects on the endometrium. That doesn't sound like it's a good thing if I have unopposed, you know, um, activation there. So we'll see there's some downsides for certain, you know, so you do worry about some, some risk for things like, um, you know, for instance, uh, you know, vaginal bleeding and things like that. So, you know, there are, there's some differences between these as we'll, we'll look into them. And again, um, we don't really sure why they fully work, but it probably has to do with various tissues expressing different types of estrogen receptors or maybe different kind of flavors of the same estrogen receptor such that they have different activities. So that way bone reacts differently than the uterine tissue versus the breast tissue as an example. Um, now, as you might imagine, by blocking estrogen um, receptors in these tissues, you can end up running into some issues. So for instance, um, you're going to have a lot of hot flashes and vomiting in these patients because you're basically losing all that estrogen activity they would normally be making. So that's kind of the downside there. But you can see it being used for like breast cancer prevention, um, palliative care for postmenopausal women, you know, things like that. Um, it was kind of its most common use there. Um, and again, you could use it also from an osteoporosis standpoint. We didn't really talk about these drugs too much back in the rheumatology section, uh, but that is one benefit. Again, you get better bone density for those patients there, at least from, you know, you're not losing that effect, I should say, from, from blocking the estrogen because it's activating it in the bones. Uh, but certainly, as you might imagine, again, getting that partial agonist activity, that increased risk for endometrial cancer, the vaginal bleeding, and then you still get some liver effects. So you can certainly see thromboembolism being at risk, right? So there, there are trade-offs with something like this. As compared to something like raloxifene, which is going to be more acting as an estrogen on the bone and the lipids, but it doesn't stimulate the endometrium or the breast tissue. So with this one, you don't really have the endometrial cancer risk, which is good. Um, and it also is going to be um, good for preventing things like breast cancer and, and high risk. I guess it's a high risk omen. That sounds kind of ominous. High risk women uh, would be the, the way I'd want to say that probably. So, you know, different flavors of agencies are probably the two of the more common ones that you're, you're going to be running into most likely. Um, another agent here, uh, you'll see clomiphene or clomid. This is actually kind of interesting because this one's used for uh, basically inducing ovulation. So if you have patients who have, are having difficulty uh, conceiving, um, this may be a drug they'll give there. So this is interesting because it's a uh, partial agonist and actually ends up binding to the hypothalamus. So basically it tries to interrupt the feedback loop by basically making it seem like there's not enough estrogen activity because it's only partially agonizing those receptors. So the hypothalamus says, well, there's not enough estrogen here. How am I going to fix that? It's going to release more FH, uh, FSH and LH, and that should kick off the ovulation cycle again. So that's why you may see Clomid being used uh, for that particular purpose. Uh, next, we have our estrogen antagonists. So these are going to be far worse in terms of side effects because these are going to block estrogen basically everywhere. Um, and so you're going to find that there's going to be um, a lot of masculinizing effects. Can't clomid cause patients to have twins, triplets? Um, I'm not sure of the specifics. Um, you know, it's always one of those things you hear, like people go on. Um, actually, you know, it's funny. One of my um, my wife's friends, she was unable to carry a child her own due to some medical issues, um, but they ended up using a surrogate. Um, and I believe that they um, uh, had to use clomid as part of the process there. Uh, but that surrogate ended up having twins. 
you know, so it's like, I guess I got the BOGO deal from, from that standpoint, which I don't know if I, I would appreciate that kind of sale, but you know, there, there are two kids are pretty cute. So I guess it, I guess it worked out in the end, but, um, yeah, so maybe there, there is some increased risk. I don't, I don't know what the actual percentage is necessarily, but, um, anyway, so something like Danazol, uh, also is going to have some host of side effects due to things like, uh, having some androgenic and progestinal effects. Remember by blocking, the estrogen receptor specifically, you're going to be basically inducing menopause. So a lot of those same symptoms are going to be happening here, as you're going to see. Um, there's actually several different uses for it that we'll run into. So things like, um, one, it can actually suppress ovarian function, which kind of makes some sense there. Um, is able to sort of inhibit that, that, um, that surge of LH and FSH you would see sort of towards the second to third week of the menstrual cycle. Um, and it can be used for things like endometriosis by blocking the estrogen receptors is able to, um, you know, basically prevent the, the development of that tissue. And hopefully that won't cause as much irritation and pain as it normally would. Um, also interesting enough, you can use it for some hematologic conditions. So things like, uh, idiopathic, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, uh, Christmas disease, you know, things like that. Uh, but certainly, as you might expect from the different actions here, um, weight gain can occur due to some of the androgenic effects, um, glucocorticoid effects, you're going to decrease breast size, um, you know, hair growth, you know, hirsutism because you're again, you're losing those estrogen effects, deepening of the voice. So pretty side effect pro, uh, laden, but you know, useful for patients who don't really have any alternatives, right? So this would be sort of a backup agent to some of these other ones. And then we have the aromatase inhibitors themselves. So this is basically blocking that conversion of testosterone into estradiol. And so you can imagine here, not only do you lose the estrogen effects, but now you also have a lot more testosterone being formed as well. So these are going to be even more androgenic overall. And these might be used uh, for an example for people who maybe are resistant or not good candidates for something like tamoxifen. You could do that as an alternative potentially. But then things like anastrozole, letrozole, eczemistane. Eczemistane actually tends to be the worst out of the bunch here in terms of uh, side effects because it's an irreversible inhibitor. So until that patient makes new aromatase, it's basically, you know, it's going to be uh, completely inhibited. And so you're going to see sort of the most dramatic effects out of that drug versus something like a reversible inhibitor like letrozole and anastrozole. So, and again, here you have to worry about things like fractures because you're going to be losing all that estrogen effect on the bone. Lipid profile is going to be suffering here. Um, really few pro-estrogen uh, issues here and you're going to see with tamoxifen so maybe no bleeding risk or no uh, clotting risk but certainly you're going to run into those issues especially from the the bone standpoint so that's a that's a big deal okay so that's pretty much it for the stuff uh the things we're going to be covering for the exam do you guys have any questions in the meantime uh, someone said, are we supposed to give normal saline for the assignment or dextrose for the sugar levels um what did i put fluids on the Assignment? I don't believe I did. No, just just the two meds for sedation and then the three antibiotics. That should be all you require for that. And I, I guess if you wanted to write extra stuff, you could, but I'm not going to grade it. I might tell you if it looks really wrong or not, but I would not be. Don't worry about that. Don't give me more work than I already have, okay? There's 61 of you guys. It's already a lot. Okay. So anyway, so that's that. Um, let us do a Kahoot. Oh my goodness. Uh, play now. I don't want to show you that. Can't see the questions early. All right. Here is your pin to come on in. And I'll keep an eye on the sticky board, see if any questions come up in the meantime. Now, I did set these all for 20 seconds, so all of you, uh, Naval gazers out there that like to wait to the last second, you're gonna to have to think on your feet. So Oh, I'm a Kahoot. That's very funny. And the uh, the exam is all finished up, it's all been reviewed and ready to go, so I think It'll be a good Friday, I hope. You guys may not think it will be a good Friday, but it should be. Me no pause. Uh oh. <laughs> Is the Kahoot the best place to announce that sort of thing? I don't know. Would fail now. Oh, my good. Go. 
got 40 in. We got 60 participants. Are we missing somebody? Oh no, we got a few that are, are watching together. That's right. Don't need to send out the uh, cops. You had to go find somebody. That's good. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. You guys, the pen will still be there, so you can do that. I don't want to fix the settings. Uh, okay, well, I'm just going to go for it. See how it goes. All right. Let's say mesalamine enemas or acid would be most likely to benefit which patients? Oh, you know what? I think it's a, I included this question incorrectly. I, I, I apologize. GI is not on this test. It's on the last one. But you guys should know this one anyway. So this is a freebie for you all. First question, I already screwed it up, man. No good. Yeah, very good, right? Remember, uh, the enemas are good for ulcerative colitis. Not really good for anything else, especially like Crohn's, because it really wouldn't touch those tissues. And you saw enema, and some people thought constipation, but nope, not this particular drug. Okay, the rest of them should be good, though. I hope. Uh, which is not a common effect seen with hydromorphone overdose. I think we kind of touched on this briefly, but hypertension, respiratory depression, lethargy, and meiosis. What do we think? Very good. Yeah, so... When you think about like the trifecta of um, opioid overdose, you think respiratory depression, CNS depression, and meiosis. Now, meiosis is like kind of classically described as happening. So if you ever have someone like had overdose on heroin or something, you might really see those pinpoint pupils. But I can tell you there's plenty of cases I've run into um, where things like tramadol or things like methadone, things have some of like that, that norepi reuptake inhibition. They actually can have normal sized pupils or mydriasis. So some people use the pupils to make their like diagnosis, but I, I, I wouldn't use that. Um, I, I take it with a grain of salt. If you see it, that's great. If not, then I wouldn't hang my hat to say that, oh, well, there's no meiosis. It can't be an opioid. Okay, it can still be. Um, but hypertension is not real common. You may see some bumps in blood pressure if they're withdrawing, but uh, unlikely to occur with an actual overdose. And this kind of goes uh, for any opioids. This is going to be uh, pertinent to all of those. So that should be the same for any of them. Very good. Amoxifine is doing well. All right, which of the following have the potential to cause physical dependence and addiction? Methadone, codeine with Tylenol, Tramadol, or morphine? This is a patented trick question. They're all capable of causing this. Um, anything that activates the mu receptors can potentially cause physical dependence and addiction. Now, again, what's more likely to occur? Physical dependence or addiction? What do you guys think? Bamboozled yet again. I think addiction is more common than physical dependence. Anyone agree? Disagree? Maybe not. I like that quick reversal. Yeah, physical dependence is expected. If you're on opioids chronically, almost everyone's going to develop some degree of physical dependence, okay? Addiction is a much different thing there, right? That's where you're using the, the substances despite harm. Um, this is very dependent on a patient's genetics, uh, social situation. I mean, there's a million factors that go into it, and it's not easy to say, yes, this person will become addicted, this person won't. But it's almost guaranteed that if you're on it for any long period of time, uh, there will be a bit of physical dependence associated with that. Everyone can withdraw even if they're not addicted to these substances, okay? Um, Right. Someone has a question. Uh, someone said, how does estrogen therapy alleviate endometriosis pain? Wouldn't estrogen increase the proliferation of the ectopic endometrial tissue? You would think that, but it's honestly, it's that follicle stimulating hormone, the luteinizing hormone. If you can help to blunt that by kind of activating that negative feedback loop, that will help to mitigate some of that. So that's my understanding of how that's going to help um, in terms of that. So let's see. Um, the next question coming up. Which of the following NSAIDs would be preferred in a patient with a history of GI ulcers? 
Use Ketorolac, Naproxen, Ibuprofen, or Meloxicam. The GI question, but I know we covered it in the ortho sections. Okay. Very good. Remember, meloxicam is really the only one on this list that has some degree of COX-1 selectivity. Um, so that would be something to consider there, right? So if they had that history, I'd probably use this. Um, I'd probably recommend something like a celecoxib being even more COX-1 selective, but that's kind of as far as we can get on, uh, I'm sorry, COX-2 selective, I should say. Uh, that's as far as we can get in terms of that spectrum, because anything more selective than celecoxib, we saw uh, had to be taken off the market due to the increase in death and, and whatnot, which is you know not ideal for your patients. Normally, like to keep them alive. Um, which one do you think would be sort of the worst here in terms of causing GI issues? Any ideas? Yeah, probably Toradol is, is going to be the worst one. Remember, that one has like a three to five day maximum. And you'll see that a lot if you're using it inpatient is it'll be like an auto stop on the on, on Toradol to make sure you can't give beyond three or five days. And so that's uh, an important consideration to make there uh, because that risk for GI ulcers is going to be you know a lot higher than with the other ones. Good drug, but not for long-term use. All right. Let's see, the first-line treatment for gestational diabetes is glyburide, metformin, dietary modification, or regular insulin. I think we have endo next. We'll be able to talk all about diabetes. We'll probably talk for hours on that stuff. Uh, interesting. Yeah, so always, 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 if you can, for pregnant patients, go with the non-pharmacologic stuff first. I know it probably seemed like a little tricky because you're like, well, the pharmacist is ask, asking me, so obviously he wants me to pick a drug. Not in this case, right? Fewer drugs are better, especially in pregnancy. So in this case here, if you can fix it with diet alone, that's going to be great. Um, may not be possible, especially if they like pre-existing diabetes. Um, and so in which case, any of these three are going to be, could be used. They have shown some safe use in pregnant patients. Um, a lot of times I think insulin might be the one that a lot of people would want to go with because it is more quote unquote natural because that's, that's what we release ourselves. This is the same insulin, the same amino acid sequence as what we produce. And again, using a protein being a big molecule, it can't really cross the placenta. So it doesn't really affect um, the fetus unlike uh, you know some other drugs could that are smaller can get across. So that's kind of one of the benefits of insulin versus some of the other ones. But you have to inject yourself, which is kind of the downside. Patients may not like that. And again, if you have questions, feel free to post them up. You know, uh, Which medication blocks sodium channels to prevent neuronal transmission of pain signals? Be buprenorphine, capsaicin, lidocaine, or naloxone? Very good, right? So um, if you recall, what does buprenorphine do? What kind of drug is that? Partial, what type of agonist? Uh, exactly, the mu receptor. So remember, buprenorphine is uh, not used for pain control. It is just used for helping patients who have opioid use disorders to transition them hopefully off of opioids eventually, right? Because it's a partial agonist, it's not going to be used for pain because it just doesn't get the same effect like you would out of something like methadone. And methadone you will see being used uh, for chronic pain in some cases. It's more of a recent trend over the past few years than what it was kind of traditionally used for. Um, how about capsaicin? What is that drug doing for us? You're my four-year-old in the background. She just got back home from school, so... Uh, right, so it's depleting substance P, right? So remember, it causes it to release initially, which can be uncomfortable, be a little bit painful, but eventually will, um, if you use it consistently, will go away, and then that will, you know, help to, to decrease the sensitivity of those pain fibers, basically. Um, and then how effective would naloxone be for pain? Bad. I, that's, yeah, not very, not at all very good. Um, yes, yeah, so that's the opioid antagonist, so it would not do a thing. In fact, if they were on opioids, it would make their pain even worse because now their opioid effect is missing. Very good. 
Um, someone said, can you explain what sugar pills are used for one more time? I don't know what I'm so confused on that. Um, yeah, sugar pills are just kind of another term for like placebo pills, right? Um, so it's basically a drug or a pill with no active ingredients in it. You could give to a patient and say, listen, here, this is going to fix your blood pressure. And maybe to some degree, they, if they think that it's going to fix their pressure, maybe it'll do something. Um, but that was one of the problems we ran into with behavioral health stuff is that frequently um, it was uh, you do see a strong placebo effect with a lot of behavioral stuff. So they feel like they're going to be taking something for their depression. It may actually help with their depression. Um, so that's why I, I mentioned sugar pills. Just another term for placebo. All righty. A uh, patient misses three doses of her OCP. How should she get back on schedule? Uh, DC the rest of the pack and start a new one on Sunday. Take the whole pack at once and restart next Sunday. Take one extra pill for three days and continue as normal. Or take three pills today and continue as normal. Very good. Um, so if it's one day missing, take an extra one that same day, no problem. If it's two days, double up for two days, you should be good. Uh, three days or more, and just go ahead and DC the rest of the pack, right? Um, they want to tell them to use some backup contraception just in case if they are sexually active. Um, and yeah, they can get started on Sunday. Now, could technically, could they say it's like a Wednesday and they were like, oh my goodness, I missed three days worth. Um, you know, can I, start, can I just start today? Can I start a new pack today? Would that be all right? Mm hmm. That is correct, Shelby. Right. So, again, there's nothing magical about Sunday in terms of birth control. You can start any day you want. It's just a matter of when you're going to have the withdrawal bleeding. Again, if the weekends are usually when they're working, maybe they don't care. Maybe it's fine. Um, it just depends on what their preferences are. Uh, which med is indicated for DVT in the postoperative period after a hip replacement? So someone got a hip replacement, was laying about, and then all of a sudden they now have a DVT. Do I give Alteplase, do I give Aspirin, Warfarin, or Noxaparin? Very good, right. So what would be the problem with using Warfarin in this case here? Not immediate. Right, it doesn't do anything for an active clot, right? This is more for prevention of clots, and it takes like a couple of days for it to really kick in. Make love, not warfarin, perhaps. Um, right, so it does take some time to kick in, so that's why you have to bridge it with something else in terms of warfarin. Now, had I put something like Eliquis on here, like a Pixaban, would that have been appropriate? Yeah, you, you probably could use that, right? So so in that case there, because something like a Pixaban's an anti-10A inhibitor, uh, yeah, that, that'll work almost immediately, just like an Oxaparin would. Uh, so that might be reasonable as well. When would I want to use Alteplase, do you think? All right, so they're having, uh, what type of stroke? Not just any stroke. Ischemic, very good. So they're having ischemic stroke, but more in more in terms of talking about DVTs, what would we think of? Yeah, right. So if you had someone who's having like a massive PE and you weren't able to maybe um, get them to like interventional radiology or somewhere where they can get that taken care of more interventionally, um, you could do out the place. If they're like unstable going to cardiac arrest, you could do out the place and that may be used occasionally. I've done it a handful of times uh, back when I was in the, the adult world. What about an ischemic limb? Um, Probably not systemic out to place. There may be, and I don't have a ton of experience with this, but there may be some instances where uh, like an interventional radiologist or someone could actually go in and apply out to place to the, the actual site where the blockage is. And that may be uh, something they do. So they'll do that sometimes for strokes. They can do that for, um, you know, heart attacks. There's, there's different ways they can do that. So that, that could be a potential. I'm not sure if it's done a lot though, uh, by any means. And then aspirin, does that really work for venous clots? Nah, not really. It's more on the arterial side of things that, where that's going to be helping out there. A very emphatic no from Andrea. Very good. Uh, that's my other question. Could you please repeat uh, what was safe for use in gestational diabetes? Yes. Um, so insulin is probably like the most like quote unquote natural thing because regular insulin is the same amino acid sequence as what we produce. So it's, a, it's the exact same insulin, right? Um, 
And the fact the only difference between like because you've ever seen like humulin versus novolin, the only difference is like how they make it in terms of like what organism they've engineered to make it, whether it's like E. coli or a yeast or something like that. Um, but it's the same exact protein that you would be making yourself. So from that standpoint, the fact that insulin's a big protein can't cross the placenta relatively safe. Um, there have been instances where metformin has been used, which is like an insulin sensitizer, which I'll get more into in the endocrine section later. Uh, and then with um, uh, gliburide or glipizide, any of those sulfonylureas, those basically make the, uh, the patient produce more of their own insulin. Uh, and that has been uh, used as, as well. So really any of those could be potential options, but you want to hit the dietary stuff first. And I think um, a lot of women, I imagine, would be pretty motivated to do so. Because um, again, like I said, a lot of people don't want to take medications while pregnant. Uh, they worry about, you know, even if it's a, you know, in a small chance, it could still affect their fetus. They, they usually shy away from that. At least that's been my experience. Okay. Up next. So which medication for RA works by inhibiting the Janus kinase proteins? Be tocilizumab, etanercept, tofacitinib, or methotrexate. Very good. Yeah, Zelgians would be that that Jack inhibitor um, uh, classification. Again, there's a couple other newer ones that are still fit into that, but, um, yeah, it's the newest class we have here. Uh, how about tocilizumab? What does that work against? Very good. Yeah. Kelly, IL-6 is going to be the target for that one. Um, oh, is it funny? Is it bad? I only remember that one because of all the commercials that come on. I don't know. I don't get, a, I don't watch a lot of TV. So, um, that's very funny that it's getting a lot of, um, uh, you know, promotion, but it makes sense. Though. I mean, it's like an orally available product, um, you know, instead of having to use like infliximab and, or, um, you know, Humira inject yourself, uh, it's able to be taken orally. So that's a huge, huge benefit from a patient standpoint, but that's very funny. Um, and again, I, uh, you guys should be watching less TV and studying more. What are you doing? Come on. I'm just kidding. I don't care. Um, how about a Tandercept? What is that working against? Anyone? Anyone? Hmm. There's a TNF alpha inhibitor. So there's another, is that first TNF one that we talked about? I know you think a lot about Humira and, and, and Remicade, but uh, Imbril is also another one of the TNF alpha blockers as well. And then everyone knows methotrexate blocks what? Very good. Folic acid. Yes, cannot utilize folic acid. What would be, uh, the FDA recently put out a warning on Zelljans for serious cardiac issues slash cancer risk. Um, yeah, I've not recently looked at it, but we can check it out together if you want. We have enough time. It's LJ and Let's see. So again, when you're looking at this stuff, it's always good. You can check out like, you know, the top here and they always just like put special warnings and stuff. So certainly we talked about serious infections, but you can look at things like mortality. So, okay. So, uh, greater than 50 is greater than one cardiovascular risk factor treated. Uh, tofacitinib at higher all-cause mortality, including sudden death, right? So, you know, that could be another good thing. Maybe I'll add that for next time, uh, but probably not on this test, uh, certain malignancies. Yeah, you find that it uh, tends to happen a lot with a lot of the um, uh, the biologic products as well. You see those, those risks associated with that. So, again, you know, um, take the good with the bad in a lot of situations. I see. Why would you give uh, for DVT in a pregnant patient unfractionated heparin? Um, actually, for for DVT in pregnancy, you can do anoxaparin or unfractionated heparin. Um, either are pretty safe. If you look at the actual molecules, they're fairly large, um, so they don't really affect the fetus that much, which is good. Um, so yeah, any of those heparins would be totally fine. I don't know if there's any evidence for use for some of the newer anti ten a anti ten a inhibitors in pregnancy. I've not looked at that yet, um, but I'm, I, that may change as time goes on. So who knows? No problem. Again, I am I am fallible. I don't know everything, so I, I always like to learn new things as well, just like you guys do. Uh, which of the following should prompt immediate discontinuation of oral contraceptives? Intermittent headaches, breakthrough bleeding, acute chest pain, or skin hyperpigmentation? Very good, right? Because acute chest pain could be what? 
E E yes, very good. Uh, right. So that would be a big warning thing, you know, if it was like all, all of a sudden they have you know unilateral leg swelling, you know, all those kind of warning signs of DVTs, PEs. Um, those would be stuff you'd really be worried about. No, like stroke isn't super common because again, it's more on the arterial side than on the venous side uh, typically. So that would be less of a risk there, but. Um, you know, again, if they get intermittent headaches and it was like, oh, it's the worst headache of my entire life, then yeah, that would be a different story. But, you know, routine intermittent headaches, I wouldn't necessarily worry too much about that. Um, breakthrough bleeding, that typically improves as time goes on. Uh, and, you know, the patient may want to stop due to skin hyperpigmentation, but it's not necessarily like an absolute, um, you know, deal breaker in terms of discontinuing it immediately. So, very good. Uh, what is the max allowable acetaminophen in a day for a patient receiving hydrocodone acetaminophen? Again, sometimes I ask questions because I want to like really tickle your gray matter and find out if you can apply this stuff in a very nuanced and uh, sort of fashion. Sometimes you just got to know certain facts, right? So this is like one of those cases there. Uh, 4,000 milligrams, four grams right? The unit measure messed you up. That's the point, right? Um, you got to know your units. I don't know if I, did I ever tell you about the, the aspirin story um, where the units were told to me incorrectly? Just real briefly. So I had a, I had a case one time where um, a, uh, a nurse, I was talking to a nurse. They were trying to get a consult. I was talking to a nurse on the phone for an aspirin overdose. And I've mentioned before, aspirin overdoses can be quite scary if they, the levels get particularly high. Um, and, and in fact, a automatic indication for dialysis is once the levels get up to like 80 to 100 uh, milligrams per deciliter. And so, um, you know, because the patient could uh, certainly uh, develop a huge amount of bulk acidosis, start to seize and just die. So I had a, a nurse I was talking to one time. And they said, oh, I said, well, it's the aspirin level. Uh, and they go, oh, it's 400. And I go, so the patient's dead, right? Like you're getting the, the chaplain to come by, uh, getting a, a, you know, chaplain consult. And they're like, no, the patient's like fine. Maybe they're breathing a little bit fast. I said, well, hold up. Like, what are the units on that? They said, oh, it was micrograms per ml. Once I did the conversion, the milligrams per deciliter is like 40. Much less, you know, high level, but much less scary than something like 400, which would be sort of incompatible with life. So units are important there. Uh, but yeah, 4,000 milligrams, if they have a history of like hepatic impairment, you may want to drop that lower. So something like 3,250 is frequently recommended. Um, but the max, as long as they don't have any, you know, other past medical history that would, you know, uh, interfere with this, is 4,000 milligrams. And that's all sources. So if they're taking OTC, Tylenol, in addition to Lortab, uh, these all have to add up. And if they exceed four grams, then that's no good, right? Okay. Moving on. Which of the following medications is most appropriate for acute treatment of pain? We use oxycodone extended release, oxycontin, we use Lortab, heroin IV, or fentanyl patch. We use here. Very good. So why wouldn't you use uh, oxycontin for acute pain? It's ER, very good. It's an extended release product, right? I don't, may, I probably don't need to have 12 hours, eight hours of relief from from the oxycodone extended release, but immediate release, yeah, I'm gonna get much faster onset, shorter duration of action. That would be appropriate there. Uh, how about the fentanyl patch? Why would, why would, it, would we not pick that? Local, not local. Like it still gets absorbed systemically. Um, you're right, it is for chronic pain, and it does take time for it to really kick in, like 12, 24 hours for it to start to saturate through the skin and get absorbed. So, um, yeah, not fast onset, so I would certainly not recommend that. Um, does anyone know how to increase the speed of onset of a fentanyl patch? Maybe done uh, illegitimately. Warm it up, yeah. So I guess maybe you guys may have heard this before. Um, if you warm it up, that really expedites the release of the, the fentanyl through the skin, um, usually in a very um, uh, not safe manner. Uh, so like you'll hear patients who, yeah, so avoid the, the hot tubs. Um, you'll have patients who will, you know, get to a hot tub with a jerjizic patch on uh, and will end up passing out in the water and drowning potentially, right? Um, I, there's one case where uh, someone tried to kill themselves and basically took like, 
10 fentanyl patches, put it on their abdomen, and then took a, um, a, a blow dryer, basically, and was trying to heat them up just to absorb as much as they could. So, um, yeah, people do wild stuff uh, with that. I would not mess with fentanyl uh, unless you have a good reason to use it, for sure. And obviously heroin IV, that would not be... Um, that would not be appropriate, really. Even though a lot of your patients may be using that, right? I don't know if you guys know this. I used to have a heroin addiction myself. It took a while to break, but I was just, I was just, I couldn't get enough of, of women saving people. It was just my favorite thing in the world, you know? All right, which of the following should be avoided in patients taking phenylzine or Nardel? I think uh, white wine, fava beans, roasted turkey, or tilapia. Still cracking myself up about that joke. Very good, right? So, i not sure that, yeah, th things are going to get a little serious there, didn't you? Exactly. It's good to see your reactions. Um, I saw a lot of groans and eye rolling, so that was that, that was the appropriate uh, reaction there. Although I do have a bit of a qualm with you guys. I know some people were checking out my office yesterday, and I had a bunch of antidepressants in there, and someone stole them. So I hope you're happy now. You know. Um, all right. So MAOIs, right? Phenylzine. So remember um, what we uh, should avoid here. So that's the bougie foods we were talking about. So um, you know, red wine, uh, anything high in tyramine, you know, so the aged cheeses, aged meats, all that stuff, fava beans in particular happen to have a high amount. Um, but like fresh stuff is generally fine. Fresh meats, fresh uh, vegetables, white wine, uh, canned beer, you know, things like that tend to be pretty okay from that standpoint. So, um, again, it may seem a little esoteric, uh, and you probably won't see a ton of patients who are taking, um, you know, MAOI specifically, but it's still good to know from things like, um, you know, if they're taking linazolid, Zyvox, if they're taking something like selegiline for Parkinson's, those are the things that you really have to be cautious with because a lot of people don't think about those MAOIs uh, or them having that capability and can still run into problems, right? Uh, Selena's saying, I heard the class above us got you a dad's joke book and you'd read them some jokes from it. Yes, I, I still have, the book might be at my office actually, so it's, I'll have to go grab that at some point so I can read a few to you all. Uh, your dad's response to the R2-D2 pick was focus all your time on that class. Screw the rest. <laughs> That's very funny. I'm glad he appreciated my R2-D2. If anyone doesn't know, I have an R2-D2 cooler in my office. He is uh, close to life size. So perhaps at the next lab, you can come check him out. Don't look inside him, though. Whatever you do, don't look inside. Uh, which is uh, agent is the best treatment um, option for pregnancy-related hypertension? Do you use furosemide, ramipril, methyl dopa, or candesartan? We think. Interesting. Got a lot of, a lot of uh, change up there, a lot of a bit of the spread. So recall, there were several that we said are like just absolutely cannot use, right? So remember, anything affecting the ACE system cannot be used. Those are Category X drugs. So Ramipril, Candesard, and any of those medications are not going to be useful there. Typically, in terms of like hypertension, we, we remember that Lasix is um, not typically used as an antihypertensive, right? There's a lot of compensatory mechanisms that sort of limit utility of that. Um, however, methyl dopa is sort of like a little bit older drug, but it was the drug of choice for a really long time. What are some alternatives that we could use to that for pregnancy-related hypertension? Labetalol, yep, that's a good one. What else could we use potentially? Maybe they were having like pre, like um, early contractions. What could kind of serve double duty there? So MAG would be more like on an inpatient sort of setting, like if you had like preeclampsia. Yeah, so like a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker would be good there. So like nifedipine or nicardipine, uh, nicardipine is an IV, but nifedipine is a, a common one there. Um, so that could be good to pull sort of double duty, right? So that's a kind of benefit to that one. Very good. Someone said, uh, my best friend brother died of a heroin overdose, a little bit of an insensitive joke. I'm, I'm sorry, don't uh, that happen. Um, like I said, I've had a family member that also died from uh, fentanyl laced into heroin. It's a very unfortunate thing. Um, play on words, but I'm, I'm sorry that you found that insensitive. Uh, let us continue on. Let's see. Uh, which of the following would treat an acute anxiety attack most quickly? We do buspirone, alprazolam, fluoxetine, 
or Desvin Lafaxing? What do we think? Very good, right? So um, acute on, like you know, someone's having an acute panic attack, um, Alprazolam, other benzos are typically going to be your go-to. Um, what's kind of the downside of using one of those for like an acute panic issue though? Say for something like that, they, they, someone had to take a test. Yeah, so uh, sedation would be a, a big one with that. So you'd kind of consider, yeah, you could have some memory impairment associated with that. Usually oral benzos, I wouldn't worry too much about that at typical doses. Um, but yeah, that could be a concern as well. Um, how about these other ones? When would you want to use those? For anxiety specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so more like long-term uh, prevention of anxiety. So things like, and again, be careful sometimes, uh, things like more norepi effects, things like desvenlafaxine, they can sometimes aggravate that a little bit. The norepi tends to be a little bit kind of uh, agitating. Uh, so for most patients, you probably still want to start out with like an SSRI. So like fluoxetine is a good option there. Uh, if they couldn't tolerate that, or if you, maybe they're already on an SSR, you might add something on, maybe Buspirone or Buspar could be a good option in that case too. So it really just kind of depends on how you want to sort of implement those. But yeah, SSRIs I think are most common for sort of long-term maintenance. And then you could have like an as-needed, you know, Alprazolam or Klonopin or something like that. They, they could use as needed for, for acute anxiety. Yep. All right. Um, let's see. Outside the question. Okay, can you explain uh, why a calcium channel blocker would be good for treating hypertension in pregnant patients having contractions? Yes. So if you recall, we talked about tocolytic therapy. We talked about things that can kind of help to inhibit um, the uterus from contracting. And so it's a smooth muscle, just like in lots of other places, uh, just like on the, the blood vessels. So by giving a, a dihydropyridine specifically, you can help to relax that uterine smooth muscle. And it will then also help to treat the blood pressure as well. So I've had, actually had a family member who was on um, uh, nifedipine for that particular purpose. It killed two birds with one stone, so to speak. Uh, and then they were able to, you know, avoid having to be on like labetalol plus something else like terbutaline or, or something, which those two would actually antagonize each other pretty, pretty effectively. So if that makes a sense. Up next, a uh, patient with ADHD and substance abuse issues would benefit most from which of the following? Uh, mixed amphetamine salts, bupropion, dexmethylphenidate, or atomoxetine. Very good. Um, so it's important to kind of like recognize which one of these are going to be um, out of the amphetamine category. So things like your dexmethylphenidate, the mixed amphetamine salts, um, uh, list dexamphetamine, you know, just because it doesn't have um, amphetamine in the name doesn't mean it doesn't fit into that category. So that's why I put dexmethylphenidate there because it kind of you know, tricks you up a little bit. You want to be able to recognize all of those. Um, any of the amphetamine based products, again, or C2, they do carry that risk um, for addiction and, and uh, physical dependence. So it'd be something you want to be cautious with that they have that history. As an alternative, though, you could use something like atomoxetine or Stratera. It works as like an SNRI, uh, even though it's not used for depression, but it has some effect uh, here for um, ADHD. Um, sometimes, like, you may put, like, more adult patients on this, I've seen in some practices. It just depends. Uh, well, butrin, uh, you know, is going to be used more so to treat certain addictions. So, for instance, like nicotine addiction, we know well butrin can be used for that. Um, but for ADHD specifically, that would not be used, more, more so for like depression and whatnot. All right. Uh, which of the following is an abortifacient but is also used to induce labor? Um, Misoprostol, oxytocin, nifedipine, or terbutaline? Very good. All right. So misoprostol has kind of had a history of being used as both, um, you know, any kind of prostaglandin. Um, we talked about like dinoprostone, you know, being used more locally in order to help uh, with cervical ripening and helping to kind of move things along. Um, which one of these other ones would also be considered to uh, be like a labor inducer? Very good. Yeah. Pitocin or oxytocin. 
uh, would be the one there. Um, and then the other two are actually tocolytics, right? So um, either as a you know, dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker or as a beta-2 agonist, both work to, to relax the smooth muscle of the uterus to prevent the contractions from happening. So again, um, the two of these is, uh, you know, these two different categories being kind of represented here. So you want to make sure you kind of understand how they work. So that way you got to understand, okay, which one's helping to prevent labor, which one's helping to induce it. So you want to, don't want to mix those up. All right. Uh, what can be given to patients when receiving infliximab to prevent infusion reactions? Or do adalimumab, epinephrine, methotrexate, or diphenhydramine? So to prevent infusion reactions. Very good, right? So this is to do with the infusion itself to like kind of prevent some of like um, some of the the itching and and uh, rash may appear with this because remember infliximab is that chimeric protein, so it's a higher tendency to do that. Um, so Benadryl can be useful from that standpoint. Um, when would I want to use epinephrine? Right. So if they have anaphylaxis due to getting that medication, so again. Their blood pressure starts bottoming out. They start to complain of difficulty breathing. Like those are the things you're looking for. And you'll oftentimes have standing orders for that available. So it'll already have an order saying epinephrine, 0.3 milligrams, uh, you know, IM, PR in anaphylaxis, something like that. Um, what is the benefit of using methotrexate with something like infliximab? So, right, so it helps with suppressing the reaction that your body can develop to the infliximab, right? Because your body can develop antibodies not to cause anaphylaxis, but just to kind of neutralize it over time because it sees it as foreign. Uh, so methotrexate can kind of um, uh, kind of prevent that and sort of um, make sure that it uh, stays effective for longer, right? Um, the uh, When talking about helping to cover the gap, that's more so with something like a corticosteroid being used when starting methotrexate, for instance. You could do a corticosteroid to help out with inflammation right now and waiting for, you know, that month or two before methotrexate really kicks in. So that, that's one option you have there from that standpoint. Very good, though. Uh, what else could I give to prevent those infusion reactions? What else might be good to give? Good, Tylenol, you could do that. And then steroids are, are very frequent, especially with infliximab. Uh, it's very often they'll getting, uh, they're getting a dose of corticosteroids. The, again, the side benefit of giving the steroids is it not only prevents infusion reactions, but also treats the RA that they're experiencing as well. So you kind of get two, um, two for one sort of use there. Very good. Uh, which of the following is true regarding medical marijuana? We just say short-term memory loss is a potential side effect. Memory or weight loss is a common side effect. Oral administration has a fastest onset, or it may only be prescribed for indications supported by randomized controlled trials. Very good. Remember, and you know, as it currently stands legally, you guys won't be the ones able to prescribe medical marijuana, but you still may see patients who are utilizing it uh, either from a medical standpoint or just recreationally as the case may be. Um, right, short-term memory loss is certainly a potential side effect. They can certainly be under the influence, impaired judgment, all that stuff um, you think about when uh, patients are utilizing marijuana. Um, why is weight loss not a common side effect? Right, it actually causes uh, the munchies, so to speak. So you actually can see weight gain more so than anything else. Um, anyone know like what's the kind of the general onset of action between like smoking versus oral uh, marijuana? Any idea? Right, so smoking is much faster. If you think about, you're inhaling it, it gets into the the lungs. There's a huge surface area there. It's going to absorb very quickly. With the oral stuff, that like, you can sometimes get into trouble with those. Um, as there's some interesting case reports coming out, like Colorado, when they first had made it more recreational. Um, you can sometimes have like 90 minutes before like oral uh, more, uh, marijuana preparations actually kick in. And so one one of the challenges that you'll have, find with some of these uh, patients is that they'll take like an oral dose. And then they'll sit there and wait for like 30 minutes or so, and they don't feel anything, right? So then what do they do at that point? That's why you eat one brownie, not 10. Right, so if they're waiting and they don't feel anything, then they go and take more. And then they wait another 30 minutes and nothing happens, they take more. And so they end up dose stacking 
Uh, and then by the time you, the first one kicks in, you've had way too much. And so that's one of the challenges you'll run into with oral is that people don't understand sort of how it's going to affect them, especially if they are uh, novices to the world of, of marijuana. Yes, say hello to the moon. Uh, some people said they, uh, they caused uh, couch lock where basically they were just so high they just were stuck on the couch and couldn't move. And some people uh, would even like present to the ER. Now, again, how many times have I seen someone present to the ER just for using marijuana? Very rarely, unless they got into a car accident. But in some of these cases, people are so having like, you know, paranoid delusions that they actually called 911. So it could, could happen there. All right. Up next, uh, controlled studies in women fail to demonstrate risk to the fetus during pregnancy. What pregnancy category would you call that? of controlled studies in women that fail to demonstrate risk to the fetus. It would be, uh, sorry, the letter's out of order, but I randomized the answer names, but A, B, C, or D. Very good, yeah, so if we have good evidence, and this is usually like retrospective evidence, it's not like we carry out like new trials for drugs. A lot of times we have like, you know, decades of use of medications. Uh, in women uh, just because the meds have been around for a long time before a lot of these regulations came about that we can say, yeah, there's probably no documented harm here. It's probably fine. That would be an A. You know, if sometimes if there's like animal evidence of harm, but in humans we haven't seen anything, that'll oftentimes get a B categorization uh, at that point there. Um, obviously C is like a big, I don't know, maybe good, maybe bad. And D would only be if there is a specific reason where the risk to the uh, fetus are outweighed by the benefits to the mom, right? Like life or death sort of situations. Very good. Say, so, uh, which of the following could cause lithium levels to rise in a bipolar patient? It would be eating a whole bag of salty potato chips, polydipsia, dehydration, or starting treatment with amlodipine. Very good. Now, why would dehydration cause your lithium levels to rise? Low blood volume, renal elimination. Right, so it's renal eliminated. So if you're in a state where you're trying to hold on to fluid and hold on to salt, because that helps to hold on to fluid, you're going to hold on to the lithium as well. So if you're in a salt retentive state, you also hold on to lithium because they look just like one another on the periodic table. Your can, body can't tell the difference. And then if it is um, your body's in a salt eliminating state, then that's where you're going to find that you will also lose lithium as well. So honestly, someone who had a big bag of salty potato chips would probably have, um, have a little bit lower lithium levels in any case. And in fact, if I have someone who has an elevated lithium level that we need to get that back under control, we would do basically, um, uh, you know, high rate uh, sodium infusion with, with normal saline. And that helps them to just go ahead and urinate it out that much faster. Um, you know, polydipsia would have more of a, a you know, a dilutional sort of effect, so I wouldn't worry about that. Now, I put amlodipine here. That wouldn't have any specific effects on lithium, but what antihypertensives could affect uh, our uh, lithium levels? Anyone know? ACE inhibitors could do it for sure, right, because they close down on the efferent arterial. Diuretics will also do that as well, so loops diuretic, loop diuretics, uh, uh, thiazides, any of those would be uh, big ones. Um, NSAIDs are the other big culprit that are, yeah, so ARBs will do this as well. Um, so really diuretics, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and then non-hypertension related NSAIDs are being another big one. I've seen a lot of cases of lithium, uh, actual admissions at the hospital because lithium levels are elevated due to starting an NSAID use. Because again, that cause on the afferent arterial side of things on the kidneys to cause less filtration. So very good. Couple questions left here. Uh, colchicine or cold crisp would be best suited for patients with osteoarthritis, gouty arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, or osteoporosis. What do I use that drug for? Very good, gouty arthritis. So, um, you know, specifically due to the inflammation you get from, you know, the neutrophils moving into the area causing inflammation. That's where uh, colchicine is going to come into play here. Anyone recall like, what kind of the like, most common adverse effect is with colchicine?
really, really rough on the stomach. You're going to see a lot of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea associated with this. I know I say that like for every drug, but this in, in particular is, is fairly bad for colchicine because it can affect rapidly dividing cells and the GI can be affected as well uh, from that standpoint there. So that would really be for that. Um, now, would that be for an acute gouty attack or would that be for more chronic management of uric acid levels? Very good. Yeah, it's for acute... The more for, so for acute, I think there may be some rare cases we use for more chronic, but remember our, zan, our uh, xanthine oxidase inhibitors are um, going to be for more chronic urate lowering therapy. So that's going to be more of the benefit from that standpoint. Uh, someone had a question. They say a random question. If someone is known to have an allergic reaction to certain components of vaccines, uh, such as an additive or something like that, could they be pre-medicated and still be able to receive the vaccine if they needed it? Or is it generally contraindicated if there's a known allergy? Um, Generally speaking, um, and this probably comes up most often with flu, just because that's the thing that people have to get sort of on a repeated basis. Um, yeah, allopurinol is for chronic, that's, that's correct, Marley. Um, with uh, the vaccines, sometimes there are alternatives. So for instance, if you have like an egg allergy, we can try switching out which one we're going to use. Uh, so for instance, instead of using the, the killed version of the influenza vaccine, there's a recombinant one that you can use that doesn't contain any egg proteins. So you generally try to find alternatives if you can get around it. I'm not aware of any specific cases where you would like pre-medicate. Um, generally, there's a way to sort of get around that. And keep in mind, most people get their vaccines when they're kids. Um, and so, you know, it doesn't come up as often with adults unless it's to do with the flu vaccine specifically. Maybe the COVID. I don't know if we're going to need repeats of that or not. Um, but we'll have to see uh, in regards to that. I want to think, um, that's very nice of you. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, anyway, moving on. Make sure we follow up on or end on time here. Give you guys a chance to ask some questions. Uh, which of the following products would be contraindicated in a 16-year-old female with no past medical history? Ethanol estradiol, raloxifene, spironolactone, or medroxypogesterone? Very good. So um, ethanol estradiol by itself and an otherwise healthy individual would not be indicated, right? Because you worry about which effects were you worried about? Which issues are we worried about with that? Any yeah, idea? Remember the endometrial issues? Yeah, so endometrial growth, proliferation, bleeding, cancer risk. So that's the reason why you would not want to use that by itself. You don't want to use the combo. Um, and again, I would not try to trick you on a question like that. I would put very specifically if the patient has a uterus or not, you know, things like that. It would be, it would be very clear in those sort of situations. Um, Reloxifene could be used. I don't know of any indication of it specifically needing to be used, but um, that, that could is not absolutely contraindicated, that type of patient there. Um, Spironolactone is used pretty regularly, especially with acne and things like that. So that's not contraindicated. And then medroxyprogesterone would be fine as well. You could do a depot shot in, in that age patient and that's reasonable. Very good, let's see here. Uh, which of the following is most likely to affect QTC interval at therapeutic doses? So with the etonogestrel safe though, right? Um, yeah, you'd, you'd be fine with just a progression by itself in that type of patient. Um, so which one prolonged QT? Sertraline, clonazepam, buspirone, or catiapine? Remember this is my class, not Professor Austin's class. I always get a little bit of pushback on that. <laughs> Someone said, uh oh. All right, for my purpose, the certainly does not prolong QT. We've had this discussion before, but, um, you know, sure, her slides say what they say, and I, I, I beg to differ. Um, you got got by Austin's. Uh, I apologize about that. Um, clinically, I've seen a lot of sertraline overdoses. I've never seen QT prolongation in any of them. Citalopram, so escitalopram, those are the two big SSRIs you're going to see that, right? Um, in terms of other meds that are frequently going to cause that includes your atypical antipsychotics. I'm sorry you've been bamboozled. It was not my intention to bamboozle you. I just picked a random SSRI, so that was uh, probably bad on my fault. Um, so a lot of your atypical antipsychotics will certainly do this, right? Um, I don't really learn everything. It's just one It's just one drug. It's just one thing you have to relearn. And I'm not going to put that on the test. That would be kind of mean if I put that on there for you guys. So for this purpose, it's fine. But for the test, I will be um, very clear on that. Um, and I will go down to the grave defending Sertraline's honor and saying it does not prolong QT by any means. Um, but yeah, so catiapine, certainly you will see that there. Any of the anti um, atypicals, you can see that. A lot of the... Um, 
the first gen antipsychotics can do so as well. So I always, if I ever have someone who has, um, really with any overdose, you're gonna go ahead and get um, an EKG, but certainly for patients who are maybe starting on some of these psych therapies, I may consider doing an EKG early just to make sure they don't have any pre-existing issues, especially once you start mixing a lot of these meds together. So if they need to be on antidepressant plus an antipsychotic plus a mood stabilizer, you can see these lists sort of get out of hand after a while, and you want to make sure that there's not going to be any major issues with that one. So, again, I, I uh, apologize for that uh, bamboozling that I did unintentionally. Two more questions. What is the drug of choice for acute dystonia after taking haloperidol? Is trihexyphenidyl, flufenazine, olanzapine, or metoclopramide? Thank you, Nicole. I appreciate you accepting my apology. Interesting, right? So think about what's going on here. Why does haloperidol cause acute dystonia? Any ideas? Nope, not tardive dyskinesia. That's a chronic issue you're gonna run into, right? I'm talking more acutely. Not the cholinergic action. What is, what's the mechanism for haloperidol? What's its main action? We're talking about low potency, high potency action at the which receptor? Dopamine, there it is, very good. So remember it's a D2 blocker. Remember uh, flufenazine and haloperidol with the high potency D2 blockers. The more high potency they are, the more likely are to see uh, acute dystonias, the more likely are to see neuroleptic malignant syndrome. The lower potency ones out of the first gen antipsychotics that we covered are more so anticholinergic. They'll still have some dopamine blocking capability, but they have a lot more anticholinergic actions, which help to balance out the dopamine blockade. Because as someone mentioned, you do get increased acetylcholine, but that's not causing the dystonia, right? Um, so alternatively, which one of these drugs, which of these drugs would worsen this, the dystonia? Any of them here? Regulin could do it. And then the flufenazine too, that's the other high potency one. So that would cause even worse effects. That could cause, sort of cause the NMS type of picture, that, that lead pipe rigidity. So uh, very good. Um, and obviously olanzapine is going to be a second gen antipsychotic. So you're going to see less likely uh, to run into dystonias and stuff because it's more of that serotonin action that it has versus just pure dopamine. But if you have a, someone with acute dystonia due to an antipsychotic, it's always going to be an anticholinergic drug that you're using, right? So we're going to be busting out our, um, you know, trihexyphenidyl, benzotropine, diphenhydramine, probably diphenhydramine most commonly, uh, at least if you're acute dystonias. And for more longer prevention, uh, longer term prevention, I may see like some artane or cogentum. But um, yeah, so that would be the drug of choice in that case there. Very good. And for the last question, uh, patients being started on paroxetine for major depressive disorder should avoid which herbal supplement? Yeah, cogentin also would have been good for that answer as well. Uh, valerian root, melatonin, ginkgo biloba, or St. John's wort? Very good. It was only the dietary supplement we really covered besides glucosamine chondroitin, so it should have been pretty easy. Um, any risk, any issues you can run into with melatonin and valerian root? Anything those can cause? Didn't teach it, but. Sedation, yeah, sleepiness. It's funny, like, um, like my, my wife will take like one milligram of like melatonin and she's like a zombie. It's so strange. And I take like one, I've taken like five and I'm like, is this anything? This is like nothing. Like all the caffeine in my system just lasts it off. Um, but uh, any issues with ginkgo biloba? Anyone know any problems with that? These are from memory. Yeah, bleeding is a big one. I don't know if I told you that story, but I had a lady who was on Warfarin and was starting, she was elderly and was worried about her memory. So someone told her to take ginkgo for uh, her memory uh, and then uh, basically had a massive brain bleed and I'm dying from that because no one uh, was able to sort of find that there's an interaction there between the two. So be very careful with stuff like ginkgo um, from a bleeding standpoint. if um, they happen to have anticoagulants on board. Very, very risky stuff there. Very good. Uh, so let's see who our winner is. Number three is uh, Pill Fire Pill. Who is Pill, Fi Pill Fire Pill? Anyone? Anyone? Me, it's Cassie. Very good, Cassie. Uh, how about Tamoxifene? Tamoxifene, perhaps? 
Anyone, anyone want to go out themselves? If not, how about who, who's just pill? Oh, Isabel, again? Good job, fantastic. All you guys are winners in my heart, though, right? Because you all made it into the Nova Orlando program, so that makes you all awesome winners in my book. Don't go to farm school. I, 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 I wouldn't do it again if I had to. I'd probably go to PA school if I had the choice. Anyway, let me see if there's any questions. What, um, do you guys have any questions before I let you all go? Anything for the test? If not, you're free to go. I'll post this up along with the link to the Kahoot, so you can take that again if you like. Uh, and you guys just have a great weekend. Um, I will go to answer number four. What do you mean? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So the winner, uh, their answer they get. Um, I'll, I'm going to tell them later, but don't tell them I'm going to tell them the wrong one. I'm actually going to lie to them. It's going to be B. Don't, don't tell anyone. Anyway. Um, so yeah, so I'll stay on for a minute or two, see if you guys have any questions. Otherwise, I will see you all later, and I'll check out your prescription assignments as well that are due tonight.